Isn't it great to know that the Lord is with you? Merry Christmas, everyone. Welcome to Sunday School Made Simple, the fastest growing online community of Christian education, teachers and students of the word. Thank you for joining us as we continue to explore the word of God using the Precepts for Living commentary, which is based on the Uniform Lesson series. Remember to ring the bell at the bottom of this video to subscribe to our show so that you don't miss out on any lessons. And as a teacher, why not be equipped so your students don't just merely download information but actually receive revelation? Subscribe to PresetsForLivingOnline.com for complete lesson plans and invaluable additional resources. And when you subscribe, you'll have access to Sunday School Made Simple on your tablet, phone, or laptop. So go to PresetsForLivingOnline.com and get your resources today. As you know, each week we make Sunday School Simple with an easy to understand format. The text for you students of the word and teaching tips for those of you who teach. Are you ready? Let's pray. Sweet Savior, thank you so much for being with us. We bless you now for the gift of Jesus Christ our Savior, in whose name we pray, amen. This quarter is all about worship. And the unit title is David Honors God, which explores David's efforts to restore worship as the center of life in Israel. However, in celebration of Christmas, today's lesson deviates from King David to his descendant, Jesus. The title of today's lesson is The Lord is With You. And it tells the account of Elizabeth and Mary who praise God for the Savior of the world. Let's explore the text with our lesson aim. By the end of the lesson, we will survey the themes present in Mary's song of praise, value Mary's place in the unfolding story of God's saving work, and commit to our own roles in furthering God's kingdom. Let's read our first set of verses from Luke chapter 1, verse 39 through 45, and I'm reading in the New Living Translation. A few days later, Mary hurried to the hill country of Judea, to the town where Zechariah lived. She entered the house and greeted Elizabeth. At the sound of Mary's greeting, Elizabeth's child leaped within her, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. Elizabeth gave a glad cry and exclaimed to Mary, God has blessed you above all women, and your child is blessed. Why am I so honored that the mother of my Lord should visit me? When I heard your greeting, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. You are blessed because you believed that the Lord would do what he said. What's important to know? There are two key points to know from Luke chapter 1, verses 39 through 45. First of all, Mary greets Elizabeth, and Elizabeth gives a glad cry. This account is about two mothers, two unplanned pregnancies, and two sons who would change the world. It's the account of one prophet and one savior. Well, let's zoom out so we could look at the neighborhood and see the events surrounding verse 39. Mary is a teenager and she's a virgin. The angel Gabriel gives her a prophecy that she's going to conceive and give birth to the Messiah. This has been the dream of every Hebrew woman in fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecy in Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, which says, The virgin will conceive a child. She will give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. Mary is that woman, and she responds joyfully. The angel Gabriel tells Mary that her cousin Elizabeth, who was also pregnant, six months, 
she's going to have a baby also. <gasps> so a few days later, Mary visits Elizabeth, who was several years older than Mary. Elizabeth, unfortunately, had been unable to conceive. So when the angel Gabriel told Elizabeth's husband, Zacharias, that they would have a baby, he was incredulous. Elizabeth was well past her childbearing years. Because of his unbelief, the angel tells him he will not be able to speak again until the baby is born. Elizabeth does conceive. She's pregnant with John the Baptist. Mary visits her, and when Elizabeth hears Mary's greeting, Elizabeth's child, who is still in the womb, leaps for joy. Elizabeth is filled with the Holy Spirit and gives a glad cry with humility. Elizabeth prophesies and declares she is honored to have the mother of her Lord visit her. Elizabeth recognizes through the power of the Holy Spirit that Mary's child is the Messiah. And Elizabeth acknowledges Jesus as her Lord even before Jesus is born. And while Jesus is still in the womb, and while John the Baptist is in the womb, John the Baptist rejoices in the presence of Jesus. Mary blesses, Elizabeth blesses Mary and tells her that the Lord has blessed her for her faith. What a moment that must have been. It's just exciting just to go to review these verses and this biblical account is just so wonderful. The next set of verses for this lesson are from Luke chapter 1, verses 46 through 49. Mary responded, Oh, how my soul praises the Lord! How my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior! For he took notice of this lowly servant girl, and from now on all generations will call me blessed. For the Mighty One is holy, and he has done great things for me. There is one key point from these verses. Mary praises God, who has chosen her to bear Jesus. Mary responds to Elizabeth's prophecy with inspired words of her own. The following verses are called the Man Magnificat. It's Mary's prophetic song to the Lord in response to being chosen to give birth to the Savior, Jesus Christ our Lord. Well, Mary, she's poor, a Nazarene who calls herself the servant of the Lord. Her song is filled with Old Testament concepts that are similar to Hannah's prayer in 1 Samuel chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. Like Hannah, Mary is humble. She did not consider herself worthy to bear the Messiah, so she praises the Lord who chose her to give birth to the Savior. Mary recognizes that God is bringing salvation through Jesus Christ even before he was ever born. And she's in awe that what is happening to her is an honor and a gift. She trusts God with her life. She realizes she will be called blessed for generations to come. Oh, the final set of verses in this lesson are found in Luke chapter 1, verses 50 through 56. He shows mercy from generation to generation to all who fear him. His mighty arm has done tremendous things. He has scattered the proud and haughty ones. He has brought down princes from their thrones and exalted the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away with empty hands. He has helped his servant Israel and remembered to be merciful. For he made this promise to our ancestors, to Abraham and his children forever. Mary stayed with Elizabeth about three months and then went back to her own home. There are three key points from this final passage of the lesson. 
God has been faithful to keep his word by sending the Messiah. God has been faithful to Israel throughout their history. And God has been faithful to humble the proud and exalt the lowly. Mary's song praises God's mercy throughout the generations to those who fear or respect the Lord. That's what the word fear means. It means respect. And she praises God, not only for what he has done for her personally, but also for what he has done for Israel corporately. God is faithful to keep his word to Israel that he would send the Messiah. And this is a demonstration of God's character of being trustworthy and merciful. And the word mercy means not giving the children of Israel what they deserved. He's merciful. By the time Mary became pregnant, there had not been a prophet in Israel for over 400 years. There had not been a king from the line of David in 400 years either. The nation had been unfaithful. They bowed down and worshiped other gods with a small g. Idolatry. And because of this, they had been conquered by Babylon and taken as slaves to foreign lands. They returned, but they were ingrained with the practices of other cultures. And so God would punish them again and again, but God withheld his judgment. Instead, he remembered his promises and sent the Savior in spite of their lack of faith. God was always faithful to Israel. He delivered them from Egypt, and the little nation of Israel defeated their enemies who were much stronger. Mary recognizes the strength of God's arm because he reverses the order of things on earth. He removes the mighty from their thrones, and he elevates the position of those who are humble. He does not choose someone of high or noble birth or someone who is proud. But God provides for the hungry. He strengthens the weak. He cares for the poor. He gives good things to those who are hungry because their faith is in God. But those who are proud and self-sufficient, God sends them away empty-handed. God is faithful to give Israel the Messiah. And God is faithful to choose someone who is humble, his servant, Mary. The Lord was going to bless the nations through Israel, just as he promised Abraham. But no one expected that that blessing would come through her. The son would mean salvation to all people and eternal life to come. What a revelation for young Mary. So. She stays with Elizabeth for three months until John the Baptist is born, and then she returns home. Now, some scholars say that Mary left before the birth of John, but think about this. Elizabeth was already six months pregnant when Mary came to visit her, and she stayed for three months. It's unlikely that the younger cousin would leave her older cousin to go through childbirth without her help. Well. That's what's important to know about today's lesson. What's important to feel? It's important to feel humble because God chooses to use us. We are poor. Some of us are women. <laughs> we have no position of power or influence or money or fame, but God still uses us. We don't deserve to be used by God. But it's not because of our family or social status, our achievements, our age, our experience, or lack thereof, that qualifies us to be used by God. He uses the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. Oh, you just have to see law and pause and think about that. So. What's important to feel now that we know? Yeah, what's, well, excuse me, I got so overwhelmed. That's what's important to feel and what should we do in response to today's lesson? Well, we should be willing to be used by God. It doesn't get any more simple than that. 
We should allow God to use us to show his love to others and to build his kingdom throughout the world. It's an honor to be used by God. And we should honor God by doing what he has called us to do. As disciples of Jesus Christ, he wants us to use our hands as his hands, our feet as his feet. He wants us to speak. He wants to speak through us and teach through us. And God wants us to love the unlovely, to demonstrate his love for the whole world. Will we respond to this call like Mary and Elizabeth? Will we allow God to bless others through us? The choice is ours. We have only to say, yes, Lord. That's our text for today. Now, let's talk about how to effectively teach this lesson. Don't forget to begin each lesson with prayer. Pray that your students would have receptive hearts and minds to be obedient to God's word, and that you'll use creative methods to help your students understand. And pray that your students will apply what they learn to their lives. Now, to hook or open this lesson, you know, I want you to be very creative. And there may be new visitors, new people who've come to the class because it's Christmas, and it would be good to give them a small token of appreciation for their presence. So you can have that on the desk, a little small token on all the desks before they come in. It doesn't have to be expensive, just to, even just a card, a note saying, I appreciate your being here or a note of thanks means so much. And teachers, as we celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ, our Savior, and we're talking about this lesson, if you're female, dress up like Mary and give the praises to the Lord. So walk in the class praising the Lord. And if you're a male, Dress up as Zacharias, who cannot believe that Elizabeth is going to have a child at her, her age, and tell that Bible account. Oh, students love it when we dress up in character and present the gospel to them, the scriptures to them. So now, where are we? Okay, so that's our hook, or present the lessons or uh, the scriptures. Don't forget, you can also download the In Focus video from preceptsforlivingonline.com. And now you're ready for book. Invite the volunteers to read the entire portion of scriptures, even though you've presented it in character, have them read it and ask the women to read the words of Mary and Elizabeth in union. That had to be really be beautiful to hear. Now, after you do your book, you can, you're ready for your look or your this, explore the meaning. Here we go. So invite the class to answer, discuss the meaning questions. One of those key questions is this. How have you seen God at work in your family to fulfill his promise in advance? And now move on to your took or next step for application. Invite a volunteer to read Liberating Lesson, Answer the question at the end, which is, how will you honor God's call to justice and care for the poor this Christmas? Great class participation activity would be to have your class do something for the poor. End your class with refreshments and a prayer. And I want to say this as we go into our Christmas season. You know, children are so special to God, and, and this, this lesson celebrates the birth of children. Many of our children are living in foster care, um, especially in the African-American community. A disproportionate number of our children are being raised in group homes. They're in the system. So there must be a way that your church or your community can become involved to minister to these kids. And, you know, uh, taking them gifts, visiting with them, and there are many children who want to come to church on Christmas morning. So why not prepare in advance to bring children to church? Work with your local social services agency, with your foster care ministry in your church, and see if you can bring children to church for a grand celebration on Christmas morning. Let's not forget 
these youngsters who are being raised without the you know care and love of their parents for whatever reason they're not able to take care of them let's be the church and minister to these all right all right god bless you now let's talk mailbag and joining us for mailbag is minister alan reynolds our millennial theologian and we are so glad to have you with us again as we discuss some questions from this lesson. So, you know, uh, we think about the poor and the hungry, and we've talked already about those children who are in foster care and, right. and those children who are waiting for adoption. Wouldn't it be wonderful if a parent, you know, or a couple decided that they're going to adopt a child for the holidays? That yeah. would be not just for the holidays, I mean forever. Yeah. So, <laughs> um, but there are also people who are in prison, they're incarcerated. Mm -hmm. We have a lot of seniors who are in nursing homes or, you know, they're not able to get out on a Sunday morning. Yeah. What can we do for the holidays to help those among us who are poor and hungry, including the homeless, mm -hmm. instead of being so focused on, oh, what am I going to get for Christmas? How can we be givers like Jesus? Uh, I mean, this is actually something that I feel like the church is really good at during during the holidays. Amen. Um, yes, we know, are. You know, we uh, there is not a church that I know of that doesn't have outreach around the holiday season, and it's important for us to continue to do that as believers, not just when it comes to the holiday days, but all the time as often as we can uh, to be involved. But just to name a few of those things, you mean you mentioned the seniors. One of the things that I used to do uh, with the church that I was at was every time a holiday would come around, we would come together on that holiday, you know, Christmas morning or Thanksgiving morning, whatever it was, and we would go to the nursing homes mm -hmm. and we would serve meals and uh, just make ourselves available to pray with people. Yes. And uh, we would even take meals up, of course, to people who couldn't come down. There were seniors who were, you know, homebound or living in their rooms within retirement communities or nursing homes couldn't come and we would take their food up to them and you know just offer offer them a word of prayer you know let them know did that you we also were there sing for them. for them we did oh good we did <laughs> sing for them uh, as well so i mean that's one instance um for people who are homeless or people who are needy there are often shelters that mm -hmm. are open during the holidays for extended hours in ways that they wouldn't be before and going and volunteering to serve a meal to help clean up yes, um you yes, know yes. a lot of times is good at those shelters and then um all also just taking opportunities when it comes to you know kids foster kids uh, people who are in prison just taking that time to visit uh, again the church um, I got to work with would go and visit prisoners and actually have a chapel service there are some um, some um, prison systems some jails that are open to that mm -hmm. and will invite a church in to come and sing and and to, to share uh, and that really makes a difference too during the holidays it does so much make a difference and you know as we're raising our children, we need to teach them and model to them what it means to be givers. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I was raising my daughter, she only got one gift at Christmas. Mm. The tree was not covered with a whole bunch of boxes. Mm -hmm. I said, you know, it's not your birthday. It's Jesus's birthday. Mm. You get one gift. And then we had to figure out what we are going to do to give back to the Lord for the holiday. Mm -hmm. So this is very, very instructive. And as, as uh, Minister Allen said, the church is already so active and so involved. And so we just bless those of you who volunteer and who feed the hungry. Our church invites homeless and hungry people to come in on Sunday, uh, not on Sunday, but during that, that, that Christmas time mm -hmm. for a home-cooked meal and everybody's there serving. It's just a wonderful, wonderful time of year. So would you like to close us by reading our Keep in Mind Scripture? Actually, I think that because this is a woman, you should read this. Oh, you know. okay, I'll do that. Reading from Luke chapter 1, verse 46 and 47 in the New Living Translation, Mary responded, Oh, how my soul praises the Lord. How my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. We rejoice with you this holiday season. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. <laughs> Be blessed. <laughs>